Adam, I'm excited to have you. And I have so many things to talk to you about the oil, gas, nuclear, AI, your recent letter to state treasurers. But before we go into the topics, I'd love you to give a brief background on you personally and your firm. Sure. Well, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to this conversation as well. My name is Adam Rosenswag, and I make up half the firm here at Gehring and Rosenswag, or half the investment uh, professionals here at Gehring and Rosenswag. And we are a uh, dedicated natural resource investment manager. So we make investments in mostly listed companies, uh, freely traded companies of oil and gas, metals and mining producers uh, all around the world. And this is all that we do. It's what we focus on. And we've been doing it a very long time um, in different forms. I've been working with Lee Gehring, my partner, since 2007, and we've had our own firm since 2016. Lee's been doing it since 1991. So we've seen a lot of cycles. We've seen a lot of changes in the industry, and hopefully uh, that allows us to, to pass some of that knowledge on uh, to our investment ideas and then ultimately into our, into our success and returns. I've been an avid reader of your letters that you write and these are wonderful things we will have them in the show notes and i recommend highly everyone check them out i'm curious over this time frame you work in in the energy and natural resources what are the most important takeaways that you would say people who are would start an investment firm in this area should appreciate uh, probably patience. You know, the bear market in, in resources has been a grueling one. It's dragged on longer than anybody really thought possible. But I think if there's one major takeaway over the last, um, you know, in my case, 15, 16 years of doing this and at least 31 years of doing it, is really that it's a capital cycle business. It's really an industry that, that responds to investment. Um, there, there'll be times where commodity prices are really high and it seems like commodities are the solution to everything. Um, and money just pours in and eventually all that money gets put to work and new supply comes online. And then eventually um, the, the nice period of high prices gives way to a period of prices that nobody thinks fathomable. Uh, and that takes capital out of the industry, it makes people convinced that they should never want to invest in a resource stock ever again. And um, of course, that sets up the next bull market. So I think understanding that capital cycle and understanding where you are in that capital cycle becomes incredibly important. And it's something that I think a lot of investors uh, fail to grasp. I think a lot of times people think that, you know, either it's the solution to everything or it's a complete uh, waste of time that just destroys capital and should never be touched. And I think neither of those are true. It just all depends on where you are in the cycle. The cycle, you just described it from the pure psychological reasons, I'd say. Are there more to it? And is it the free market structure that kind of leads to that cycle? Or why do we have it? Why is it repeating itself and we never seem to learn from it and soften it in the next decades? Well, look, I, I think, you know, we can argue why cycles happen at all. And I think it's, it's, it's all pretty fascinating. I think in the case of resources, you know, getting into the really kind of uh, minutia of it, uh, the reason you get these cycles is because demand is gauged in mostly real time and supply often takes years and years to come online. And so you get these mismatches from time to time. And what will end up happening, like I said, is, you know, demand will run ahead of people's expectations. They're extrapolating what's happening today. They underinvest and all of a sudden the market's tight and raw materials always get priced on the marginal unit. And so when you have even one unit of shortage, you know, for instance, oil is like 101 million barrel a day market. But if you have a surplus or a deficit of as much as three or four hundred thousand barrels a day, so less than one percent, uh, that's enough to send oil prices above 100 or below 50 right? So everything happens on a marginal barrel. Uh, it's difficult to match those up exactly properly. So what usually ends up happening is you overshoot the mark on one side or the other. Prices explode to the upside. Uh, and then over a period of time, you track capital and which gets put to work. But that productive capacity doesn't come on for another five or six years in some cases. And who knows what demand will do by then. And um, actually, a lot of times the high commodity prices lead to a little bit of a recession. And so maybe demand is weak by the time it comes online. 
you know, oil is a wonderful example. Back in the early part of the 2000s, everybody thought that we were, you know, running out of oil. Peak oil was ever on everyone's minds. An exorbitant amount of capital was spent in the E&P industry, and it found and developed the shales, which were the most important oil discovery in the 20th century. Um, you know, you can look at it any way you want, but the shale oil fields brought on as much as Saudi Arabia did at its peak. And the shale gas fields brought on as much as Saudi Arabia did. So when you put them together, it's like we brought on two Saudi Arabias at the same time in the same country in the same decade uh, at a time when everyone was worried that we were running out of oil. So sure enough, that overwhelmed the market. Prices collapsed and people spent a decade staying away from the space. Uh, and just like they over extrapolate on the upside, they over extrapolate on the downside as well. So I think that that's really the fundamental issue here is the idea that that the time to bring on new supply uh, is not is longer than than how demand responds, and so people respond to the uh, cycle today, uh, and that ends up creating a future imbalance. Whether that's free market or, or or not, I mean, yeah, I think you know, energy markets are about as uh, free as they get. Uh, you know, global, they have to balance. They're physical. You know, you you need to find 101 million barrels a day of demand from 101 million barrels a day of supply. And of course, there's all kinds of shenanigans that go on with, with trading strategies, but ultimately it's a physical market um, and, uh, and it has to balance. So that's what makes it all so exciting. And understanding this mismatch of the supply and demand, this huge time lag, uh, this cyclicality, how does it affect the way you approach investing in these markets? Well, I think what it's trained us to do is to try to look out to the long term and to try to understand from a long-term basis where we are in these cycles and try to play those long-term cycles. I you know, find it very difficult, if not impossible, to um, predict short-term movements in energy prices. But I can tell you when we're used to spending $750 billion a year and we cut it down to $300 billion a year, uh, I can tell you we're going to have a supply problem. And I don't know if that happens in you know, 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022, but uh, given where valuations are, we found it to be extremely attractive. And so we got involved very heavily uh, in the energy markets in 2020, right at the very bottom. Uh, and the reason for that is we had seen, and we had been bullish of oil before that, we saw this capital spending cut cycle that had been really since 2014, 2015. Um, and then with COVID, it just took an unbelievable leg down and, and it became really quite dramatic. And what we realized very quickly was that demand would rebound relatively quickly and supply uh, issues would be much longer and harder to fix. And so we saw this kind of mismatch taking place for the next five or six years. And we said, look, this is where we want to be. So I think the way that we try to play that is to try to look out in the long term uh, and try to take a full cycle approach and realize, uh, be very aware of where we are in that within that cycle. Are we in a period of time where a lot of money has just been spent? Are we in a period of time where capital has been starved? And you want to look for the latter and avoid the former. And by long term, you mean five to 10 years horizon? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, we, t we tend to target a five year investment horizon. Um, but, you know, some trends take a little bit longer to play and some trends happen a little bit more quickly. So it, it all depends. But yeah, I think, you know, I think if we were to find something that really got us excited that we thought would happen in 10 years time, we might not invest in it right today. We might wait a year or two, but five years seems like the right horizon for us. And that explains your focus on the equities versus, say, derivatives like futures or whatever, because it takes many years and it's hard to use other instruments. It's very, very hard. Yeah. If, if, a lot of people ask us, you know, why wouldn't I just buy oil futures contracts if I think oil prices are going up? And the answer is that you have to pay what's known as the roll yield. Uh, now, today, the roll yield is actually a backwardation, so you probably could do it, but that's a very unusual structure. Typically, you know, 85, 90% of the time, the oil market's in what's known as contango, which means the future price of oil is much higher than the current price. So if you, for instance, wanted to take a five-year view on oil, you buy the five-year future contract, you're probably paying $20 to $25, as much as that, more <clears throat> than the current spot price. Uh, and so oil has to advance by just that much just to break even. Uh, alternatively, you could buy the spot contract and keep rolling it, but that ends up working out to the same. The drag is very strong. So derivatives strategies tend to work well for traders. Um, they tend to work well for really short-term exposures, but they have this huge uh, negative 
bias uh, embedded in them for the long term. So if we were short-term investors, we could use derivatives, but being long-term investors, I find that there's really no way to take those long directional bets other than the stocks. Do you at all consider the interest rates environment in your investment decisions and your future view on how they will unfold or you hedge them or you just ignore that part of the picture? It's interesting. I think it depends on what commodity you're looking at. You know, I think the interest rate environment is critically important in the gold market. And I think we spend a lot of time thinking about where we are in the rate hike cycle uh, versus, you know, how we think gold will perform. Gold tends to not perform very well in, in a large, strong rate height period. Uh, to that end, it's, it's actually been really uh, bullish how well gold has held in in the last you know year. People have said, oh, gold's moved sideways, even though inflation is going up. Shouldn't it be a good inflation protector? And you know, I think the truth of the matter is that to have a rate hike of the magnitude and the speed which we had it, and to see gold basically you know flat to up a little bit is uh, is very very bullish for for the metal. Um, so there, I think it plays a big role. When we look at you know discount rates for uh, oil stocks and things of that nature, I tend to prefer to stay away from looking at the cost of capital too closely. And the reason I think that is that um, you can hide a lot in your model in uh, an interest rate you know no one pays any attention to it it has six or seven features to it depending on whether you're using capital asset pricing or whether you're using uh, equity risk premiums or what have you and, and the truth of the matter is once that number gets all boiled together no one really thinks much about it uh, i would rather make the assumptions explicit and what i mean by that is like we look at everything on a 10 percent cost to capital basis that tends to be the standard of how the energy industry looks at things and then you say to yourself, well, if this is a really risky project in a risky part of the world, I'm going to want a bigger upside potential versus, you know, other people might increase the discount rate to get to a more reflective price target. But to me, you kind of lose some of the nuance. You're saying, well, am I really taking more risk? Well, not really. You know, it's all captured in the discount rate. Well, the discount rate doesn't help you if there's an expropriation in a risky country. So I would rather have everything on a apples for apples discount basis and then say I, I want to buy something that's cheaper to pay me for the additional risk that i'm taking but that's just me now switching gears a little bit you are the firm that applies ai to do your fundamental research which is a bit unusual i think we've seen quite a bit of applications of ai on a more short-term uh high frequency trading part of the market but talk about the reasons for you to use AI, first of all, and maybe some origins, how did all come together and uh, what exactly you can do with it? Yeah, absolutely. So look, you know, we're not uh, an AI driven firm. Um, we do have a bit of a mathematical background, um, although really not, like you said, not applied to our investment business. I mean, obviously we can add and subtract and multiply and we can even divide from time to time, but you know, we're not high frequency traders. We're not quants, we're not algos or anything like that. <clears throat> we're very fundamental. We're not even quantumental. I mean, we're fundamental investors, uh, but we're both familiar. Both Lee and I are quite familiar. Lee's a math minor and I'm a quantitative economics major. So I have, I have some math background there. Um, and the idea of sort of advanced statistics has always, had always intrigued me. And that led me to read quite a bit about machine learning and then ultimately about neural networks and artificial intelligence. And it always really intrigued me. And, and for a long time, you know, a few years, and I have a programming background as well. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm familiar in that world. And for uh, a few years, we sort of were thinking, oh, this could be really interesting, particularly uh, given whether you're looking at drill results for <clears throat> the mining industry or well results for the oil and gas industry. It is an industry that has a lot of fairly standardized data uh, that maybe we could make some some predictive results. And it's also an industry that's very uh, probabilistically driven. You know, So you'll start, for instance, think of a mining company, you'll start and uh, you don't know what's underground. You might have a sense that you're on trend of a different mine, and maybe there's some, uh, you know, outcropping rocks that give you clues. The deposit's there, so the distribution's known, or the distribution exists. It's just un unknown to the observer, and you go through this crazy process. It's like that old game Minesweeper. You know, you kind of run an aeromagnetic survey, you chip away a little bit at it, and and on and on you go, and eventually 
you, you can, can or, or may not make a discovery. And at every moment in time, the stock market is valuing that asset. Uh, and there's a huge mismatch. You know, it's just it's not efficiently, particularly in the earlier stages, it's not efficiently um, discounting the potential. And so we figured, well, look, if we can use some of these techniques and really advanced statistics just to give us a little bit of a edge at being able to understand what could be under there, the probability distributions of what could be underground, that might help. We ended up first applying it, though, uh, on the oil and gas side of things, mainly because the data is better and it's more cons concentrated and consolidated. And we purchased a database uh, of about, I think, 150, 200,000 horizontal wells drilled in the U.S. across all the basins. Uh, and we tried to run a neural network with the goal of really trying to say, look, based on where you drill the well and how you drill the well, what will the well's production profile look like? And that allowed us to answer two really important questions. The first was being able to try to predict what a basin's production profile would look like, right? So you, we all kind of take this aggregated data that the government gives us to look at what the Permian Basin produces, but now we can actually start to roll it up from individual wells and you get these historical and then projections off of the historicals uh, that, that are a little bit more substantially more granular and detailed. Uh, and then the second thing that you can do, uh, which is, is very important for us, is you can begin to try to attribute changes in the well's productivity to the different input factors. So basically, what we were trying to answer was this really complicated question. It sounds simple at the outset, but from 2014 to 2017, the average well got twice as good. It generated twice as much oil in all three shale basins, all three major shale basins than it did in 2014. Why? The industry tried to say that it was because they got really good at drilling the wells. <clears throat> so they said, look, you know, we were able to change the well design and the lateral length, and we were able to change the amount of propent, the amount of fluid, and so that's really what did it. Fine. If that's true, that's really profound for oil supply because it means that all this undrilled fringe tier two lousy acreage could now be made better, right? Everything was being made better. So what, what five years ago was the core could now be replicated in a really lousy part of the field. And so the available number of undrilled locations that could be as good as what you were drilling a few years earlier was getting actually more, even though you were drilling more and more of them, your, your undrilled inventory was growing faster than your rigs were drilling out. It's pretty, pretty important. Uh, means that we would be basically in a surplus for several years to come. Uh, on the other hand, what we determined was that, and I have to, I have to point out, we surprised even ourselves. Uh, we thought that you had gone uh, from drilling uh, all of your best tier one wells to now drilling like 30% tier two. You were getting better. That was being offset by lower quality locations and your overall productivity was inching higher. We found exactly the opposite. All of the productivity gain over that period of time came from picking your best spots and just drilling them very intensely. And so instead of turning all this tier two acreage into tier one acreage, what you were doing was hollowing out your tier one acreage and your tier two is as bad as it had always been. And that was a very, very important conclusion for us. It allowed us to make several determinations. First of all, <clears throat> it led us to conclude that the Eagle, Ferd, and Bakken were most likely uh, unable to grow. And in fact, they have not grown since we first wrote that. Uh, we then said that the Permian Basin would probably top out at about six and a half million barrels a day in the middle part of this decade. And that looks, again, right. We're at five, six now. So we have 900,000 left to go. Um, we used to grow 900,000, a million, a million, one out of the Permian every year. I think that's all it can grow going forward at all. You know, So whether that's one year of growth for Fort Peters out or two years of half growth or three years of a third growth, whatever, uh, we have sort of one slug left. And even that might be too optimistic. We're starting to hear now that wells in the Permian, their productivity is declining quite a bit. So that's what it really allowed us to do. If you think about it, there's no statistical technique prior to machine learning that would really be good at that. They're all really interconnected, the input variables. They're all strongly nonlinear. So for instance, you know, adding more propent depends on your longitude and latitude. It's not going to be the same everywhere. Um, moving to the east doesn't make something better. Uh, it depends, you know, th there's pockets. And so the, the geographic coordinates are important, but it's not in a linear fashion. Uh, it's, in, it's in a uh, very, very complex um, way. 
Uh, and then that, of course, feeds into, like I said, you know, drilling a longer lateral in the fringe is not the same as drilling a longer lateral on the inside of the plane. So the whole thing becomes very, very, very uh, <clears throat> interconnected, correlated, and nonlinear. So how do you how do you solve that? It's really tough to do. You can either kind of take a rough stab at it by saying, okay, good wells do this, bad wells do this. What do I? What does this imply out of this? Uh, that's, that's how we tried to do it before. The answers were not satisfactory to us, so we ended up using machine learning and AI to try to answer those questions. And now we're just evolving it uh, as time goes on. I'd love to apply it to both agriculture and to uh, the mining business, uh, but it's just been a little bit more challenging to find to find good data. Agriculture is probably going to be easier than mining. The problem with agriculture, though, is um, it is so um, there's a lot of noise relative to signal, you know, so weather is obviously really, really important, <clears throat> but where that, where and when that weather comes, and there's just a lot of vagary uh, to crop yields um, and, and to weather forecasting. So even if you have the model perfect, uh, any given year is really going to be mostly dependent on the weather and weather forecasting. That's above my, that's above my pay grade. I have a friend who is, building a company in weather forecasts and it is very tough oh my uh, gosh. part of what, the equation yeah weather weather forecasting you know every every not every but m many major mathematicians over the years get drawn into the web of trying to forecast weather including like big luminaries like john von neumann and it's sort of like it's too good to pass up it's the most complex uh, system modeling exercise that there is uh, it's entirely driven by you know chaos theory and the idea that minor changes in inputs have huge changes to outputs when people talk about chaos theory they talk about you know butterfly flaps its wings and then a hurricane starts and it, you know there's some truth to that uh and so um you know trying to model that is a huge challenge and we've gotten very very good at extending our you know mid-range weather forecasting from like three days to seven days but after that people have not been able to improve their forecasts at all and despite all these computers and all these imaging and satellites and stuff it's hard it is and so quite a few people are working on this right now so hopefully we'll have a bit better models and hopefully all that compute that we're throwing in on it will allow us to have a bit better models but we'll have to see uh speaking of the data and training that you used how much of the data you had to collect to train the models to get to the results you've got to <clears throat> well we actually um license most of our data from a company that used to be called shale profile now i think they're called novi labs <clears throat> and it's been very high quality data so you know we have to uh, wrangle that data and, and you know apply some filters and changes and adjustments as everybody does but most of that data was available to us um, on the weather side of things and on the crop side of things it's been a little bit more challenging we have to use disparate sources and you know begin to slice and dice things together and in terms of the how many years did it cover the oil fields data? So how many years back you could look? So basically, it looks at every well that was ever drilled from a horizontal basis. I think there's some verticals in there as well, but I'm less interested in those. Um, you know, the industry really shifted over to horizontal drilling probably around 2000. I mean, in earnest around 2010. The first wells were probably mm -hmm. 2005, six, seven, but they were so early. There was a lot of um, a lot of experimentation going on there. So, right. yeah, so about 10 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 10 years worth of data. Yeah. But I, I have to admit the length of data is probably less important than the the quant the volume of, of data. Uh, because if you think about it, <clears throat> a shale well will produce the vast majority of its eventual ultimate recoverable reserves in the first three to four years uh, of life. So after that, if you're if you have to apply sort of a simplified model to those tails you're only talking about you know five percent of the total production of the well it doesn't really matter um and so i don't need 30 40 50 years of production data in order to make good estimates i really need three uh, and then i need as many wells as many individual samples uh, as i can find so the length in this case was not so important okay yeah that makes sense and do you run this function in-house or you kind of hired some outsource firm to no, build no, no. the whole we do thing all, for you? We do it all in-house. Okay. And uh, in terms of your problems you faced and overcame here, there, what were the most memorable issues you had to deal with? 
oh, I think it's all the same issues that everybody has to deal with. You know, the the idea of I'm not sure how technical your audience is, but the idea of, you know, tuning the right hyperparameters was always very tricky, the right learning rates, you know, having a model train for three days and then eventually, uh, you know, collapse down to zero or blow out to infinity. And then you say, oh, God, I just lost three days. Um, and, and also not being a technical, you know, super proficient technical person. Uh, I had to kind of learn a lot as I went. And so there's definitely probably some early wasted time, you know, just trying to figure out how these various uh, languages and components work together. Uh, but, you know, I, I think it's actually pretty incredible, uh, the resources that are out there. I mean, it's really incredible when you think about it, that, you know, someone with a mild ma mathematical background um, between AWS and the resources that I could outsource and rent, uh, you know, on, on the cloud platforms uh, and the availability of both really high quality textbooks and then good online user communities, you know, the idea that somebody like me could build a artificial neural network from the ground up, I mean, it's pretty crazy when you really think about it. So I, I think we've come a really long way. Things are incredibly efficient these days. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not a huge technology buff. I'm not a huge proponent of technology stocks, for instance. I think a lot of these things are all, a lot of hype and not a lot of delivery. Uh, but but I do think that that the tools that are being put out there right now um, are pretty incredible. And I think that um, people's access to be able to do some very, very interesting things uh, is, is quite, quite fascinating and shocking. They are. And I think in a lot of sense, this is your programming background talking. I wonder what's the history of your programming? What languages did you use? How it all started for you? Oh yeah, the history of my programming background was was really pragmatic more than anything else. When um, <clears throat> I, I think, oh gosh, I can't even remember. I think there were several problems that I was looking to do in uh, at the last firm that I was at, and I found Excel to be not satisfactory, and so I looked to Python a little bit, and I looked to um, you know the various data uh, entry tools there, like Pandas and NumPy and things like that. And, from there became a little bit more proficient. And when we decided to leave and start my own firm, I realized that um, resources would be extremely scarce and that probably having a, a little bit of a systems background would be helpful, at least being able to tie various APIs together. And so uh, it was just something that, um, you know, I was always sort of ready to throw overboard and abandon. And instead I just spend more and more and more and more and more time doing. So, you know, whether it's some of our, accounting backends, uh, you know, being able to talk to one another, whether it's some of our, you know, email scans and stuff like that. I just, yeah, I don't know. I'm not, I'm, I'm by no means a, a hyper proficient coder, uh, but, but I can pretty much look through any code base at this point and get the general sense for what's going on. And I, I've been waiting for that moment where I hit a wall and say, well, I guess, I guess this is more than I can bite off and I haven't quite hit it yet. So whether it's the best use of my time, I don't know. Well, it looks like based on what we just discussed on the neural network side and discovering that contrarian thesis uh, on oil, it does give you an edge, the firm, I mean. That, that certainly has. There's no, no two ways about it. That, that was a really, really early call that we were able to uh, undertake um, that fundamentally changed the way we thought about the shales and what assets we wanted to own in those shales. Uh, and, and has definitely been important for us. And I think now going forward, it's going to be really important as well, because what we're starting to see is that fewer companies have the good acreage left. And so, uh, you know, how do you tell? I mean, just first of all, what does it even mean to have the good acreage left? And then how can you try to really begin to quantify that? Because I think uh, as time goes on, what's going to start happening more and more is that companies that do have high quality remaining inventory will effectively be able to uh, enjoy strong high profitability. And those that don't will just be disappointing and disappointing and disappointing, eventually to the point of having to maybe, you know, think of replacing the asset or, or merging. And we've seen that already, you know, in <clears throat> the Marcellus, which is a big gas play up in Appalachia, in the northeast part of that play, there's a company called Cabot Oil and Gas, which for a long time was uh, the darling of, of the shale industry. And that case, this was sort of predates some of our models, but um, 
we had heard rumblings that their inventory wasn't as good as expected. And when you started to look at the drilling density using our models of the high quality acreage in the Marcellus, you could see it was, it was pretty well drilled out in the Northeast. Now, <clears throat> I say it predates our models because we didn't have very good company specific lease data that we do have now. Um, so it wasn't able, you weren't able to really winnow in company by company, but you could see where, around where Cabot was, it was, it was awfully drilled out. And so we stayed away from that name and eventually they forced, they were forced to sell themselves at a fairly distressed price, but that happened very, very quickly. And I think you're going to start to see that again, where companies that uh, begin to run into trouble because of inventory issues will get penalized and those that have high quality remaining acreage will be rewarded. And so I think being able to go in and uh, look asset by asset will become more important. And, and I think we have the ability to do that. And, and it's scary because if not, then like, what do you do? What do you look for? You kind of have to wait for the quarter and wait for the results to come out. But then, you know, that's backward looking and you're, you're in the same position as everybody else. And that recent quarter also doesn't give you much insight into what's going to happen next and over the it's next true. few quarters anyway. So even if you kind of got spared, uh, in this time, it doesn't mean. Totally. And, you know, you, you look back and, and, and the same is true also of, you know, overreactions on the downside. Like you look back, for instance, uh, I'm going to say it was in 2018 <clears throat> and uh, Pioneer announced a series of wells that were gassier than expected. And that brought up this issue of like the bubble point and the idea that had they lowered um, had they lowered pressure in the fields enough that the gas was beginning to come out of solution and 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 run into problems. And, you know, in retrospect, we weren't near a, a peak in either Pioneer's production profile or in the Permians. We had a lot of room to grow in 2017, 2018. Uh, but um, people panicked about it. And I think they sold the stock off like 20 or 25% in, in, in a matter of a couple of days. And, uh, you know, it was, it was helpful to realize that that field was not at maturity yet uh, and say, okay, look, you know, that could be a problem one day, but probably not today. It does sound like a powerful way of uh, looking at the data in a differentiated way than the rest of the industry. I wonder if uh, the other players are starting to pick up your approaches and build the similar models, or they're still kind of less interested in doing that. Yeah, I don't know. Hard, hard to say. I think, I think in a lot of these fields um, where people sometimes get um, turned off by some of these tools and i'm sure it's happened to to a lot of your viewers or listeners is <clears throat> trying to marry the domain knowledge with the technical expertise and so like we've had this before where, where you know a, a big data firm uh, which was obviously the buzzwords a couple of years ago everything was big data now it's maybe more ai but you know big data firm would come in and process all your data and tell you that you know you know large sovereign wealth funds would be your biggest clients. You say, yeah, well, I know that. I could tell you that in five seconds or whatever. Now, the data, I'm sure, bears that out, but it, but it's not, you know, the problem is that the person looking at the data doesn't have the domain level expertise. And so I would suspect that to the extent that some of these tools are being applied, um, I bet they're happening in places with a lot of domain expertise and a very real advantage of, of being able to put computing power to work. And so I would think that within the E&P companies would probably be where you're seeing a lot of it, uh, as opposed to the Wall Street banks that, uh, you know, their, their big data group is sort of separate and distinct from their oil and gas group. And they talk, I'm sure, from time to time, but neither really, you know, trusts the other. So I would suspect, you know, if you look in the likes of EOG, which is always kind of first to everything in terms of um, technologies and I'm sure Pioneer as well, and, and, and I'm sure others. I bet that they're all implementing, you know, various AI strategies um, internally. This is uh, the observation I also saw many times that just having very smart people building AI models is not enough. You need, you need those people almost become an expert in the subject matter, which means sometimes they're not too excited of becoming those experts, but you have to kind of convince them or find the right people who will be both excited right. about the subject matter and 
the experts in AI. Oh yeah, asking asking the right question um, is more important, honestly. You know, particularly with the amount of computing horsepower that is being thrown at these problems now. Uh, you know, being able to frame the question and frame the um, ultimate task at hand, I think, is the most important thing. You know, realizing what you're looking for, and even for us, it was difficult. You know, the idea of like what makes a good well. You know, that that that's really tricky. You know, the idea of saying well, uh, based on you know how you drill a well and where you drill a well, which is contributing to what, that's a hard thing. What if you move areas and you double the lateral length? Uh, now all of a sudden your production goes up 60%. You know, how do you try to begin to disaggregate that? And even just thinking about some of these questions was was really tricky, um, you know, so. So it's a lot of ingenuity and a lot of creativity goes before you apply any compute to solving the actual so. problems. I think that's right. And I think it also helps, quite frankly, that we're in the investment world and that we're not, you know, in the academic world. And I've come across this so many times is that, um, you know, the, the level that we're held to is very different. In some ways, it's much more severe because if we're wrong, uh, there's real investment consequences. But we also, you know, we're not looking for the same level of robustness that an academic would look for. Um, and, you know, in fact, a very prominent academic asked if I would write a paper with him on a subject. And I said, I don't know, you know, I just don't write to that caliber. If, if I can find an underlying trend in the fundamentals that is um, somewhat predictive uh, and that is being able to kind of give me good intuitions and good uh, reads into the underlying trends taking place in that market, that's really important to me. But it might not pass muster from a peer review perspective. That's entirely possible. And that's fine. Uh, and so, you know, we, we see that issue also sometimes, oh, less so now, but when um, on the mining side, investment houses sometimes will bring in mining engineers to run their mining portfolios. And I've often found that their risk tolerance is so tight and so narrow because they're used to, you know, building mines that send people underground. So they're, they don't like to work with uncertainty at all. Uh, whereas, you know, as an investor, um, if you're buying something for 10 cents on the dollar, you don't have to be super right. You, you have to be just a little bit right and still be able to generate quite a nice return. So, yeah, it's definitely liberating it's in some sense environment. It's, it's quite stressful in others, but it, it is. <laughs> uh, that's for sure. Zooming out a little bit here and from just a few fields. Uh, in the U.S. to all the overall oil gas situation around the world. You've been quite bearish, I'd say, on the supply side of the things. So talk about the your view overall on the our potential to increase or even maintain oil gas production globally to supply the needs of the global economy. No, we, we have been very bearish on, on the ability to grow oil supply around the world. Uh, and a part of the reason um, is just the empirical historical data. You know, we really haven't grown oil supply around the world. If you take out the U.S. shales, you know, the U.S. shales have provided about 15 million barrels per day of uh, supply growth when you take in <clears throat> about 10 and a half million barrels of um, straight crude and another four and a half or so of uh, NGLs. And, you know, if you look, this is going to be a gross simplification, but if you figure that demand is growing by about a million barrels per day per year, you know, the shales have provided 15 years worth of demand growth and they've been around about 15 years. So you can argue that, you know, all of the global demand has been met by uh, shale and the rest of the world, OPEC and non-OPEC um, plus, uh, has basically been flat to slightly declining. And that's true. Uh, and, and that's quite scary. You know, 2005 was basically the last time that you had any major, major growth. And, and every year, some new projects come on and other projects decline. And, but on balance, you know, you haven't been able to grow conventional oil supply in the last 15 years. So I think we start from that. Uh, you know, we start from the idea of saying, okay, look, you know, we're not running into oil. That seems clear. Um, we're not spending more, so it's unlikely that we're all of a sudden going to reverse the trends that have now been in place for 15 years. And I think the whole world has been really, really, really made to feel a false sense of security because of the shells. The shells were enormous. 
the shales were absolutely enormous. Like I said, on the oil side, they were as significant as Saudi Arabia. And on the gas side, they were as significant as Saudi Arabia. And I was joking with somebody. I said, you know, if you look in the textbooks on Saudi Arabia, the history of Saudi Arabia in the 1950s and 60s, I guarantee you a lot of the ink there talks about the oil industry. Whereas if you look at the history of the United States in the 2010s, um, people think that the oil industry just destroyed value and did nothing. Uh, you know, this was a monumental shift and it forced the whole world into a false sense of security that oil was not something that was uh, scarce. And so we stopped spending a lot um, and we've not, you know, we've not discovered <clears throat> one barrel for every barrel that we've produced now for about 30 years on the conventional side. Discoveries come before reserves and reserves come before production. So we haven't made the discoveries. We're not certainly don't have the reserves and now production has basically flatlined and is rolling over. So where is that going to come from? It's not immediately clear. Uh, I think there's a huge hope that the world can find shale uh, throughout the throughout the planet. And there is shale. There's shale everywhere. Uh, however, not all that shale is going to be productive. And going all the way back 10 years, I think it was like 2012, we decided to try and, you know, it was more uh, qualitative. It was quantitative too, but it wasn't like a, a big data model. It was just looking through all the different shale basins around the world. There's, we have data on all of them. The U.S. Department of Energy or U.S. Geological Survey puts out data on all the shale basins around the world, and we looked at what makes a good shale. You know, whether it's clay content, thermal maturity, depth, thickness, organic matter. Um, marine or, or, or lacustrian deposit environment, all these different things. And um, we ranked them. We tried to come up with an index. And you can you know, argue how we made the index. That's fine. Again, I'm not an academic. I can make whatever index that I want as long as it works. And what we, we scored each of the shale plays around the world. And what we concluded was that of the 10 best, seven of them were in the U.S., <clears throat> and on a global basis, you know, there are very few that passed muster. Uh, one is in Russia. Um, the other two good shale basins, one's in Argentina, uh, the Vaca Muerte shale. That's probably seen the most development out of anywhere in the world outside of the U.S. That can work according to our models. However, Argentina is not a good place to commit capital, and we've seen you know complete shutdown of that industry. And then the other's in Colombia, but there's a moratorium on shale drilling in Colombia. So, you know, People found that really shocking when we put it out. We said, look, you know, the U.S. has seven of the 10 best. I think there's sort of a feeling of fairness, like, well, shouldn't it be evenly distributed around the world? That's just not really how resources work. You know, South Africa has gold. Russia has palladium. The U.S. has oil and gas. Canada has a bit of everything. Uh, but, you know, there's areas that are really rich and areas that are poorer. And, and the U.S. is very, very rich in shale deposits. And it has to do with the fact that most of the U.S. mid-continent and, and, and west um, was a giant inland sea, very quiet, very thick depositional environment. You know, all of that organic matter died and stacked up. Basically, with what is the Gulf of Mexico today extended all the way through most of the mid-continent of the United States. And that made for a very, very good shale deposition environment. But even that great shale resources will not be able to supply additional 1 million barrels a day per year of growing demand. I think, I think you're, getting, yeah. you're getting to the end of it. Yeah. So what, where do we go from here? And, but first, maybe you did this analysis, you said, a decade ago. Anything changed since then? Well, no. I mean, that, that, that's the nice thing about, you know, geology is that a decade doesn't really make much of a difference. So all, all those characteristics are still the same. Um, <clears throat> look, I think that for better or worse, that type of an analysis can only be proven wrong. It can never be proved right. You know, we, we say that we don't think there'll be shell development outside of the U.S. And the next day, there's no shell development. Does that mean we're right? No. You know, a month later, there's no development. Does that mean we're right? No. Here we are 10 years later. So I'm starting to feel a little bit more confident that perhaps some of our intuitions were correct. Um, but somebody I'm sure would argue back and say, no, it has to do with availability of equipment or whatever. So it's not something that can ever be proven right. It's only something that can be proven wrong if, if and when we have a major shell development somewhere else in the world. And so far, we haven't seen that. So we'll have to wait and see. And your base scenario 
would be for the future of the oil supply to stay flat or decline or grow, grow sluggishly? I think the key is going to be that it's going to have to have higher oil prices to incentivize capital to come in. So, you know, we never run out of oil. Um, things always seem bleak. Uh, and so I have a hard time seeing how we're going to see, you know, very strong supply growth. But I would have said the same thing before the shales. But what I do think is going to be necessary here, we need to spend more. And so we need higher oil prices, high profitability, and we need investors to begin to care again about the energy industry. Until we have that, there's there's almost no chance that you see major oil supply growth from here. Um, so, you know, physically, where do I think it could come from? Look, this is all subject to change, right? It completely depends on discoveries that are made. It depends on changes in technology. If you had to ask me right now where I would try to commit dollars to grow supply, I think that the offshore market has been largely left uh, alone for the last 10, 10 years or so as the shales came online. It's more expensive oil for sure. Uh, but in some cases, it can be really prolific. So I would expect to see a, a fairly major resurgence of budgets in the offshore space. And we have some offshore investments trying to take advantage of that. Um, you know, the oil sands have some ability to grow production. The problem with the oil sands uh, are that uh, it's carbon intensive oil. Um, and so that it's kind of been the first to drop off in, in the world of ESG that we're in. But as somebody said to me the other day, you know, 90% of the carbon in a barrel of oil comes when you burn it, not when you produce it. So the idea of kind of fixating and saying what's high carbon oil and what's low carbon oil is a little bit of a misnomer, uh, right? Because in, in the case of low carbon oil, you're, you're still going to generate 90% of the total CO2 than you would from the, from the high carbon oil because it all comes from actually burning the crude. So I could see ESG people who have completely given up on the Canadian oil sands may be changing their tune one day based on, you know, that type of an analysis saying, oh, well, it's actually not so bad. So you could get some growth there. Um, you know, the North Sea seems pretty tapped out. Uh, you know, there's pockets in West Africa that have, hold some promise. There have been some disappointing results there, though, as well. Um, it, 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 it's going to be a tough it's going to be a tough decade. Yeah, we'll get to that. I think this is how you call it, the decade of shortages, and I have it in, on my notes a little bit farther down. Before we go there, just to cover some other sources of energies that you also talked about in your previous interviews or letters. Specifically, uh, let's talk about solar, wind, and nuclear, and starting with solar and wind. In your recent open letter uh, to state treasurers, you voiced concerns about the viability of it. And you did it before as well. One of the things you pointed out that cheaper price of fossil fuels actually led to the misleading LCOE, levelized cost, uh, cost of electricity numbers for the renewables, for the solar and wind. And this gives us distorted signal when we make decisions of capital allocation. So talk a bit about this. And what, first of all, what's the reasons for your concerns? And second, where do you see we go, how do you see we approach this more reasonably? Sure. So <clears throat> I think that, um, you know, for, first and foremost, I, I should say that at Gehring and Rosenzweig, we can invest in wind and solar if we wanted to. Uh, and so, you know, we're not sort of a, an old, uh, stuck in our way, uh, oil and gas firm. We don't have private investments in oil and gas. Uh, we don't have any mandate to be any percent in oil and gas. So I could be in, and, and I promise you in many ways, it would have made my life much easier, uh, if I could have jumped on the wind and solar bandwagon, uh, you know, or not if I could, if I had jumped on the wind and solar bandwagon over the last, you know, five, six, seven, eight years. Uh, unfortunately, we we do hold ourselves uh, to the idea that we want to make sure our investments agree fundamentally with our outlooks and with our views. And when we look at wind and solar, I have a very hard time seeing how they can meet our energy needs. And the reason is because they're very inefficient forms of energy. Now, what do I mean by inefficient? Well, as with anything, when you're talking about efficiency, you have to look at the output relative to the input. And in this case, the amount of energy 
generated compared to the amount of energy that goes into that system. And in the case of something like oil and gas, you have a 30 to 1 energy return on investment. So you put in one unit of energy, you get 30 units out the other side. And in the case of wind and solar, uh, that could be unbuffered. And I'll tell you what that means in a second, as high as 11 to 1, but probably really closer to 8 to 1. And it could be as low as you know 1 to 1 if you buffer it. And so you basically at one to one, you're not generating any net energy at, you know, 10 to one, you're generating, you know, 60 percent less net energy than you would if you were doing the same unit going into oil and gas. And so you do that over and over and over again and you have an energy crisis. And I think that's what we're seeing today. <clears throat> so why is it so energy uh, inefficient? Well, it just requires so much material to create these sources of energy. You know, you think about the amount of energy trapped in natural gas. You know, you take your natural gas stove, you turn it on, you wave your hand over. I mean, that's a lot of energy in a very, very small unit of volume uh, compared with, you know, the wind blowing uh, across the plains. Uh, there's some energy there for sure, but it's just not the same. You know, you don't burn your hand sticking it up in the wind, uh, on, even on a windy day. Um, you know, similarly, like the sunlight, right? You, you're talking about heat. It's the same uh, principle as natural gas, but the density is off by several orders of magnitude. And so the way that you can uh, harvest usable amounts of energy from such an undense medium is size. You know, that's why the windmills stand 200 feet tall. And that's why the solar panels take up hundreds and thousands of acres. Unfortunately, all of that size requires a lot of material. And so what you end up with is you end up with a very energy dense form of, of, of energy extraction. So if you look at, for instance, the amount of, you know, embedded energy and all the steel and all the concrete and all the cement and all the copper required to wire up a, a series of wind farms, you know, you're talking, I think it's about 10, if I'm not mistaken, I think you, you're talking about 10 or 20 uh, windmills, each standing the height of a 20 story building, uh, all connected, you know, with huge amounts of copper um, on the gathering system to create the same amount of usable energy as a single Permian Basin well. You drill six wells off of a pad and they're done in two months. So it's just not, you're not the same. It's not the same order of magnitude. And it's the same thing <clears throat> from a capital perspective. You know, when you look, people talk about the total levelized cost of electricity. Fine, we'll talk about that in a sec. But if you just talk about the capital cost, you have a huge amount of upfront capex when you're dealing with wind and when you're dealing with solar. And so what we decided to do is it, we said, OK, you know, everyone loves to talk about how cheap wind and solar have become and they fall 90 percent. And so maybe they don't compete quite yet, but they will awfully soon because they fall 90 percent. And so in another 18 months, they'll fall another 50 percent. And they've extrapolated these trends. But we said, look, you know, you have something that's very energy intensive and very capital intensive and the cost of energy's collapsed 90 percent and the cost of capital has collapsed by over 100 percent so perhaps that had some impact on the cost of the levelized cost of electricity or the total cost of ownership of wind and solar and really nobody had, had tried to do that you see i mean even now i see all the time extrapolations of the cost curve and they call it the learning rate it's 20 percent, 20 percent per year that's the learning rate and they attribute implicitly all of the reduction in cost to the ability to better manufacture wind and solar. That's not true at all. You know, we estimate that as much as 70% of that reduction just came from cheaper energy and cheaper uh, co cost of capital. And I mean, it stands to reason that if you <clears throat> lower your input costs, then the total costs of manufacturing go down. But no one ever tried to really quantify that. And so we tried to. And maybe we did an okay job. Maybe we missed some things. I don't know. But it did tell me that that certainly over half and probably closer to four fifths of the uh, total cost reduction over the last 10 or 15, 20 years even came from a massive collapse in energy price and a massive collapse in capital cost. And we made the case that if those were to reverse, which we think is happening now, that um, we would start to see costs of wind and solar go up, which was something that was not really even thought possible. And that's what we're seeing now. And so projects are being canceled. You're having massive cost overruns. And uh, I think, unfortunately, uh, fortunately, unfortunately, whatever, uh, that, that, that's going to continue. Um, wind and solar are not ideally suited sources of technology. They have really poor energy return on investment. Uh, the other thing uh, is that um, they're not 
base load, they're intermittent. So the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow. And that's really important. Uh, you have to back them up with batteries. Batteries are extremely energy intensive to manufacture. And so you layer that on and it becomes a real fool's errand. Uh, nuclear, on the other hand, though, is extremely efficient. You know, if oil and gas is 30 to one and renewables are as low as five to one or three to one or even one to one, uh, let's say five to one, um, nuclear is 100 to one. And next generation, fourth gen nuke is, is 180 to one. And so, <clears throat> you know, I think the big uh, takeaway is that all this talk of wind and solar, if what you want to do is remove carbon, you should all be looking at nuclear. Um, it has no CO2. Uh, it has extremely high efficiencies. It has this sort of magic quadrant, as people like to say, of high efficiency and low carbon. That's what you want. That's what people should be getting. Um, and uh, instead, people push back on, on nuclear uh, in, in favor of these things. And I think it's just absurd. I do see some pickup of interest in nuclear in, say, in Nordics, in Poland, most recently. What's your firm thesis on nuclear say for the next decade do you at all expect some growth there or do you see it's gonna be still controversial and not much to expect there i think that um we are seeing a sentiment change in nuclear uh, i really hope that that continues um i think that um if, if that's the big takeaway from this entire energy transition then everything will have been worth it and we could see our best days ahead of us with really abundant clean energy you know like the, the our hopes and our dream it's all right there it's sitting right in front of us it's the technology that we've used for 60 years um you know why we don't take it i'm not sure uh but it, so I, i'm hopeful uh i'm a little cynical i've seen it you know for a long time um you know and i've seen people's moods come and go i'm hoping that this time's a little bit different and that it sticks. I do think that you're seeing some important moves being made by large, you know, administrations and governments and policymakers. Uh, but you know, at the same time, the news just came across the headline here that uh, you know Brookfield is going to uh, raise their uh, second energy transition fund. It'll be twenty billion dollars. The first one was fifteen billion, uh, which let's see, when was that done? Probably last year. Um, and you know, oh, well, let's see. Well, I guess. I guess they did. Brookfield has had the nuclear, you know, influence here with with uh, the Westinghouse Electric deal with Cameco. So maybe I shouldn't be too critical of them. But you know, my point is that there's still a huge amount of interest and a huge amount of attention being paid to renewables. Uh, nuclear is less controversial than it was six months ago, and I hope that it continues that way. Uh, but you know, I think. I, I think that that renewables can be worse than useless because they're they're diverting people's attention away from solutions that could work. Wind and solar, they're not going to work. It's not. It can't. It can't solve our problem given how much energy is required to be put into the system to do it. I think the pushback that we can get from some uh, app people uh, is that yes, the energy return on energy is low but if we're running out of fossil fuels we'll be left with nothing at all so this is still better than nothing yeah so it, it's interesting and you know originally this concept of energy return on investment came about in the middle part of the 2000 i mean originally in the 1970s and 80s but <clears throat> most recently in the middle part of the 2000s when it was applied to the idea that we were running out of oil um so yeah, there's, there's probably some truth to that. And in fact, we used to write that um, wind and solar would have one day work when we ran out of conventional hydrocarbons. Uh, we're trying to do something a little bit different now, though. We're trying to force wind and, or force wind and solar to push out oil and gas. And that's probably not, not the right way to go about it. Uh, but yeah, there's some truth to that, I suppose. Um, you know, we're never going to run out, uh, obviously, of uh, oil and gas, but they do become more expensive and energy intensive. And as a result of that, their EROIs decline as well. But now thinking about the current situation, nobody has a crystal ball for sure. But uh, if you have to guess how the future energy profile of Europe, China, India and the US for the next 10 years will look like, what would you say will be the rough sources of energy 
Yeah. Well, look, I think that natural gas becomes really important. You know, natural gas was such a kind of throwaway cast off commodity that no one cared about up until a year ago. Um, but, you know, now people are beginning to realize natural gas really is a, an incredibly important fuel source. It's clean. It has half the CO2 uh, of coal. Uh, but it also has no particulate matter. So from an air quality perspective, you know, which is what usually what when citizens really require, particularly in the emerging markets in places like China and India, I, I think what impacts them more directly is is the air quality uh, in their cities as opposed to, you know, the potential for global warming 20 or 30 and 50 and 100 years from now. Um, <clears throat> so I think that you'll have a growing energy pie coming from both China and India, dramatically so. Uh, and I think gas takes a larger share of that, probably at the expense of coal, wherever possible. Uh, renewables, you know, will deter, will, renewables don't stand on their own. So they'll de be determined by how much government policies get pushed and stuff like that. Uh, but, you know, the more renewables you put in the grid, the more you begin to destabilize it and the more problems you run into. And I think we're going to see more, more and more nuclear power, both third generation reactors and new fourth generation reactors as well. China has a, already a big new build program. Uh, India does as well, more modest, but still large. Um, and, and, you know, these fourth generation reactors, we've done a lot of work on them. They're, they're quite real, you know, and, and the, uh, the, the, their potential is very, very real. So I'm very hopeful there. It does look like this whole situation with energy became a wake up call for getting back to focus on nuclear and returning to so. rediscovering the things that we knew for a long time, that this is actually one of the most efficient in terms of energy return and investment type of energy. Sounds good. Adam, thanks a lot. We covered quite a bit of ground, have more questions, but I guess it's time for us to wrap up. Where people can learn more about your work and where can they follow you? Please go to our website at gorozen, G-O-R-O-Z-E-N.com. We, we put out quite a bit of free material, um, quite a bit of uh, podcasts and videos and things like that. So we're very, very open with our research and we're happy to share it with everyone. Uh, or else, you know, please look us up. There's a way to contact us there as well. And we're always happy to chat. We'll add those links to the show notes. Adam, thanks a lot for joining me today. It was a great conversation. Thank you so much.